Thank you, choir. Thank you, Pastor Paul, our musicians. Wonderful, wonderful music today, as always. We want to thank you for being here today. Uh, it's exciting as we began this mission venture. Uh, someone talked about being on, being on mission. Uh, when we leave the doors of this church, we're on mission every time we do that. And that is our mission field. And this is going to be an exciting week. Each year we have a special guest to come and to be our Love Out Loud preacher. And uh, I've been praying about who God would have us uh, to have. And usually, or earlier, in, I, I usually know who we're going to have. And I just could not get a word of who God wanted to come. And uh, so, uh, in serving on the executive committee of the Southern Baptist Convention, I had the privilege to meet Dr. Ken Weathersby, and we began to talk, and uh, our hearts just knit together. And he has such a passion uh, for people to know Jesus. Uh, Dr. Weathersby uh, is a Mississippian. Amen. We welcome you home, brother. Amen. Yeah. He uh, born in Jackson, Mississippi, uh, educated in our uh, Mississippi College, in which he serves now as a trustee on the Board of Trustees of Mississippi College. Uh, he has served as a pastor. He has served as the director of evangelism for the Tennessee Baptist Convention. He has also served our North American Mission Board, where he was vice president of evangelism, and then also of church planning, vice president of church planning. He serves the Southern Baptist Convention Executive Committee uh, as a vice president uh, with church growth and liaison with Southern Baptists and uh, working with our churches uh, every week across the convention uh, that they might fulfill the mission that God has called to. And so, uh, Dr. Weathersby, we love and appreciate you. Uh, you are an outstanding man, outstanding preacher of the gospel, and uh, we're just honored to have you. And it's going to be a blessing to hear you this week. And you can uh, see what's happening here and go back and tell the executive committee, hey, they got something going on down in Meridian, okay? And uh, pray this would catch on uh, around the country. But we honor you today. We welcome you uh, to the pulpit of North Crest Baptist Church. Let's welcome them, folks. Stay. Amen. Good morning to Pastor Dan, Sister Janet, to the staff of this church, to all the officers, and to you, God, children. Allow me to bring greetings from the Executive Committee of the Southern Baptist Convention. We are so grateful to God that you have allowed your pastor to be a part of our Executive Committee. And a part of the executive committee assignment is to make sure that we as churches in the Southern Baptist Convention, we are trying to do our best in making Christ's name known across the United States and around the world. Amen. Thank you for your gift through the Cooperative Program that allows us to have missionaries, not only here in North America, but around the world, to theologically train our students and to stand as a witness even on Capitol Hill to let Capitol Hill know that Jesus Christ is the only way. Amen. So we thank you for what your part is, a part of doing what God has called you to do. Now, I love preaching. Thank you for allowing me, Pastor, to stand behind the sacred desk. Uh, I have not passed in a long time, so I always love to preach. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I challenge us to have, we're going to read two verses of Scripture today. We're going to read, first of all, from Matthew chapter 16, beginning at verse 18. We're going to read that verse out loud, and also we're going to read Acts 1-8. If you are able to stand, I'm going to ask you to stand to honor the reading of God's Holy Word. I'm going to ask us to read God's Word out loud. The Bible says, faith come by hearing, hearing the... Word of God. Shall we read the word of she'll be on the screen as well? Shall we read the word of God out loud together? Unto you, uh, Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Haiti shall not prevail against it. Amen. Acts 1 8. Acts 1 and 8. But ye shall receive power. 
you shall be Amen. You may be seated. Father, here we are this morning honoring you with your word. Now, Father, we pray that the words that you have spoken into our hearts, that we will live out those words, those words. And Lord, we will love out loud this week. And every day you give us an opportunity to be a witness for you. Speak intimately into our hearts. Lord, we pray that you would dig out our ears that we can hear. Lord, remove any scales from our eyes that we can see. And then, our Father, we pray that you will prepare our feet that we may go. Well, Lord, we pray that you will put things in our hands that we can give. So, Lord, we love you, but we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The context of Matthew chapter 16 is Jesus is now on his way to be crucified in Jerusalem. He is living around his headquarters in Capernaum, Capernaum around the Sea of Galilee. That was Jesus' headquarters. He would oftentimes go out and come back to Capernaum around the Sea of Tiberias or the Sea of Galilee. Jesus knew that his time has come. Oftentimes we saw in Scripture, Jesus would say, now my time has not yet come. But he knew that his hour was coming for him to be crucified. So he knew that he needed to travel 85 miles south going up to Jerusalem to be crucified. But what would make Jesus Christ, instead of going 85 miles south, walking, what would make him to, to add an additional 35 miles to his walk and walk 35 miles north? What was so important in the region of Caesarea Philippi that Jesus needed to go to, to Caesarea Philippi before he was crucified? Why was that so important? This morning, I'm going to talk to us today about what's right with the church. What is right with the church? You see, Jesus goes to, to the temple of Pan. In Caesarea Philippi, there is a big temple there. If you've ever been to Jerusalem, if you've ever been to Israel, you have went to the temple of Pan. It's a big complex. The worshipers, the idol worshipers, they will come and bring sacrifices to their gods with a little G. It was a forbidden place for Jews to go. They had temple prostitutes there. Cultic worship was going on there. But yet Jesus felt like it was important for him before he was crucified to take his disciples to Caesarea Philippi. A forbidden place for the Jews to go. But yet Jesus Christ shows up. I can imagine Jesus Christ got to the temple complex. He began to walk around the temple complex. He began to look around and say, A Caesar, Augustus Caesar is God. Baal is God. Nimrod is God. All of these worshipers come and worshiping their idol worship gods. And I can imagine Jesus Christ walking around the temple plots, uh, the temple complex, seeing all of the mockery going on, seeing all the of sinfulness going on in that place. Children taken and being thrown into the cave that was there. And that they believe that the blood came from the underducts that their, their gods did not receive their offering. And they're throwing their children as children sacrifices to their gods. They're throwing goats and pigeons to their gods. And I can imagine Jesus Christ knowing the truth. Looking around, he turns to his disciples and say, who do men say that I am? If all of these claim to be God, who do men say that I am? Well, Jesus, John, some say that you are John the Baptist crying in the wilderness. Some say that you are Elijah, one who called down fire on Mount Carmel. Some others say that you are Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. And then Jesus looks at his disciples, but who do you say that I am? 
You who have walked with me, you have lived with me, you have, I have called out of darkness into the marvel of light. Who do you say that I am? And I can see Simon Peter as though he was in life school this morning, raising his hand, saying, Jesus, Jesus, you are the Messiah. You are the Christ. You are the Son of not these dead gods, but you are the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, you are Simon by Jonah. Flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. A few points I want to talk to us some more this morning about what's right with the church and I go to my seat. Would you agree this morning, the mission of the church is right? The mission is right. After Jesus was crucified, they gathered and to worship him. And after they worship him, notice, in order for you to be on mission with God, you got to learn how to worship him. You got to understand God expect us to worship him. They worship him. And after they, they worship him, he gave them the great commission. He told his disciples, those he have called out of darkness into the marvelous light, those who have been born again, he tells us, go. Imperative. While you are going, as you go everywhere you go, we are to be about the business of making disciples. He did not call us to, to do membership enlistment, but he called us to make disciples. He called us to equip them. He called us to make disciples among all ethnic groups, among all patata ethne, among all the nations. Go make disciples, baptize them, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe my commandments. And I will be with you to the very end of the age. Would you agree that the mission of the church is right? Yes, the mission is the great commission. The great commission is what God is calling us to live and to do. It's to go. Everywhere we go, we are to be on mission with God. We are to be on mission with God while we are working beside our co-worker. We are to be on mission with God as we are cutting our grass beside and living beside our neighbors. We are to be on mission with God when we go to the restaurant. We are to be on mission with God when we are in Jackson. We are to be on mission with God when we are in New Orleans. We are to be on mission with God when we are going around the world. We are to be on mission for God because we are his instrument. I have called you out of darkness. What's right with the church? That's us. We live in a world today where everybody is, 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 is a culture of criticism. We see it on the news every day. We criticize on Facebook, on Twitter. We don't like speaking now to one another. I can remember at the North American Mission Board, uh, a brother told me, he said, Brother Ken, you missed the meeting this morning. I said, what meeting? He said, you didn't, you, didn't, you didn't read your email? What email? I said, man, email doesn't drive my life. I said, your office is two doors down from mine. You got a telephone in your office. And yet we live, you know, we live in a society today that want everything instant. Yeah. <laughs> it's so easy now with all of this social media, media to criticize one another. And many bring the same criticism, maybe not here, but other places. They bring the same criticism of that lifestyle in the world. They bring it in the church, and therefore they are critical on everything. And God is saying, what's right with the church if we always complain about what's wrong with the church? The mission is right. 
Would you agree with that? The second thing I will ask you this morning, would you agree that the method is right? The method of prayer and the method of witnessing. Amen. Notice Peter did not come to understand that Jesus Christ was the Lord on his own. It was in his relationship with Jesus, in his relationship with the Father in prayer that God revealed to him that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. If we need to understand, if we want more understanding of God, we need to spend more time with God. We need to be intimate with God. God, he has a word for each of us today. He knows what you are going through in your life. He knows that your car is going to break down before you know about it. He knows that you're going to get your paint slip before you know about it. He knows that you're going to be at a hospital this evening that you did not count on. He knows everything, so why should I spend a little time with him in prayer? This one, one night this week, the Lord has led me to preach on um, be anxious for nothing, but by prayer and supplication let your requests be made known unto God. Talking about prayer. Prayer is right. I'm reminded of a story about this man who said to the Lord, he said, Lord, I'm so grateful that I have not sinned today. I have not done anything wrong today, God. God, I have not even got angry today. But God, I'm getting ready to get up out of the bed now. I need your help. <laughs> he needed God help. Do you not need God help? Do you not need God help when things that you cannot control in your life? Do you not need God help in your marriage? Do you not need God help on your job? Do you not need God help with your children? Do you not need help with God controlling yourself? Do you not need help? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And the first thing that he is calling us to do is, well, why don't you spend a little time listening to me? Spend a little time with me in prayer. So I submit to you this morning that the method of prayer is right. And because the method of prayer is right, that leads me to the second method, the method of witnessing. Listen, if you want to continue to have your breakthroughs every day of your life, if you want to continue to allow God to break the strongholds in your life every day, if you want to continue to keep the devil on the run in your life every day, start sharing every day what God has done in your life today. Why don't you start giving praise and thanks to God for everything? Give praise and thanks to God. And why don't you tell somebody that God has been so good to me and what he has done in my life, he would do the same thing in your life. Because a witness, listen, is one who know what is true tells what he or she know to be true. A witness is warned who is able to share that they have been redeemed. And what God he has done in their life, the Bible said that the redeemed of the Lord say so. And when you witness, here it is, when you witness of the goodness and the mercy of God in your life, the main person who's going to be encouraged is you. Amen. You got to learn how to encourage yourself in the Lord. And every time you talk about God's goodness, God's mercy, God's kindness, you start getting excited. And you can say, God, I can run this race just a little bit longer now because I know that you are with me. Even in the midst of this nasty divorce, God, you are with me, with me. I can make it, God. I can make it because of his love for you. So his method of prayer and witnesses, witnessing is true. The Bible tells us the story this way. Jesus is on his way back after he had been crucified. He gave a commandment to his church. He tells them to stay. Wait, you need some power. You can't live this life on your own. You need some help. How many of you all like good help? He said, I'm going to give you some good help. 
in darkness, when you don't know which way to go, I'm going to give you some good help because you have, you have called on me to be your Lord and to be your Savior. You have repented and believed that I died on a cross and I'm coming back for you. You believe in me. I'm not going to leave you as orphans after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. After you've been born again, you got some power in your life. You got some power to witness. And so God is saying to us, the witness is a method. Number three, the third thing you need to understand, what's right with the church? Would you agree that the ministry of the church is right? The ministry, here it is. Flesh and blood do not reveal that unto you, Peter, but my Father who is in heaven. Thou art Peter. You are Peter. I will build my gathering. I will build my church. We are the church. It's not this building. We are the church. I will build those who have been called out of darkness into the marvelous light. I will build my church of those sinful folks who don't know the way, who are always contrary, who's always negative, always got something bad to say. I'm going to call you out of that lifestyle into a relationship with me. I'm going to put my spirit in you. I'm going to put my will in you too. And when I do that, I will build my church. Listen, you cannot build God's church. Pastor Dan cannot build God's church. No one can build God's church. He builds his own church. He may use us up to build them, though. He will build his church. He said, I will build my church. Listen, and all of this hell of stuff that you see, he talking to his disciples. All of this hell that you see, all of this evil working in the land, all of what's going on in America, all what's going on around the world, all of the sex trafficking, all of the disembarkery, I want you to know I will build my church and the gates of all of this cannot stop you. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against you. You have no reason to be afraid. Why? Because I have given you a ministry. What is the ministry? I have given you, anybody got some keys in your pocket? You pull out your keys. Anybody got a key in your pocket? Let's pull your key out. Let's pull your key out. I hear some keys now, right? Those are keys, right? You use those keys to do what? Lock and what? Unlock. Some of y'all use those keys to start a car, and you do a what? Turn off the car. And God has said, I have given you my spirit. I have given you my power. I have given you a ministry. What? Your ministry is to go to the very gates of hell and kick down the door and walk in. I have given you power to lock some stuff up on earth. I have given you keys to the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth have already been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth have already been loosed in heaven. And God is saying to us, if the condition of our land is the way it is, it's because we are not exercising the authority of God's word in our life into our communities. My background is planting churches. I, the church pastor told you I was a pastor, yes. But I started a church with zero members. I start churches. And the reason why Lord led me to start in church was because people needed to be saved. So I, I fled at the, uh, the First Black Southern Baptist Church in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. First Baptist Church was my sponsor in church, sent me out to a community. I wasn't even married at the time. I was getting married, but I wasn't married. So I went to the community. I knew I had a ministry. First Church had a ministry that we were trying to minister to this area. So I would put on my clergy collar, Brother Dan. 
because in the, in the hood where I was serving, I needed to be identified. Amen. Amen. I needed to be identified. Some of the places I was going, I needed them to know who I was. I didn't need somebody to see me coming from this house and start shooting and ask question later. Amen. No, 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 no. I put my ministry collar on. I go out there, and the Lord said, go get you a church. Go allow me to build my church. And so I went out there with the Holy Spirit in front, the Word of God in my heart, in my hand, and God said, go get, you won't have no shortage of unsaved sinners. Go get you some of them. We went out there, we started winning folks to Jesus Christ. Why? I've had people knock on doors and people say, I've been praying that God send somebody to me and tell me about Jesus. You see, Jesus said he has given us a ministry and we got to go and love out loud. We got to demonstrate our love for our community by what? Loving them in service. In ministry. He that among you is great, let him be your servant. You never know when you're entertaining an angel. You never know. I can remember when I first got my call to preach, Pastor Dan. I preached Isaiah 55. Seek ye the Lord while you may be found. That text, you know. I had prepared, I, I went to the library. I had all these books in my hand. I was going back to the library. Now, I had all these books, and I thought I had a 30-minute sermon turn out to be about 10 minutes, amen, you know. <laughs> but I had all these books, and I was going to the library to put the books back in the library bin. And this guy came up to me, he said, can you give me 50 cents to catch the bus? Now, I didn't have 50 cents. I don't know whether you ever been there or not, you ever been broke like that. I, I didn't have 50 cents in my pocket. I said, but hold on one second. I went up to the bin and I put those uh, books in the bin because I knew that I had some chain in my ashtray. I, didn't like, I don't like walking around with chain in my pocket, so I throw them in my ashtray. But I didn't have any money in my pocket, not even a dollar. And so, I, but the Lord knew I was going to give him 50 cents because I knew I had some chain. And I turned around, he was gone. And, and I looked around. I said, Lord, he, no way you could have got out of my sight that quickly. Was that an angel? Ever since that time, the Lord told me, if someone asks, if you have, give. Because I'm not going to allow a few dollars to rob me of my compassion. Oh, you don't know what they're going to do. They're going to go, dang, it's not, it's not about what they're going to do. It's about what he said to us to do. Because you never know when you would entertain an angel. I was in Nashville, Tennessee, coming out of a store. It was a woman standing in the middle of the street raining with a white uniform on. The Lord said, give her $20. I reached in my pocket, I rolled down my window, and I gave her $20, and I go to drive out. She said, stop. She said, let me bless you. She said, I'm from Nicaragua, and God sent me here to test the Christians. And then she, I called myself blessing her, but I received the blessing. We got to learn to understand our ministry is everywhere we go, we ought to be involved in service, which means we got to be listening to God always. We need to know his sheep. The same, we need to know his voice. The same voice that you hear when you read the word of God, that is the voice you got to understand when God is speaking to you in your heart. And the more and more you read this word, the more and more you study his word, the more and more you understand and he desensitizes you and you know his voice. And when God speaks to you, say, yes, Lord, because he has given you a ministry to bind up some stuff and to lose some stuff. I was in Walgreens. I went in to, to get my medicine from the Walgreens, and the Lord said, give her some money. And I looked, and I pulled my wallet out, 
I, I didn't have any money right here. You know what I'm talking about? I ain't have anything right here. But the Lord said, give us some money. But the Lord know that I keep behind my, uh, <laughs> behind that. The Lord know I keep a $50 bill. <laughs> I've been doing that for years. And the Lord said, give us some money. And I said to myself, do I give her the $50 bill, Lord, or do I break it and give her some change? He said, give us some money. And so I pulled the $50 bill up. I walked up to her, and I, I you know how you do it. You'll shake somebody's hand. I, I, I grabbed her hand. I slipped the $50 bill in her hand, and I was walking off. And she said, stop. She said, how do you know? She said, how do you know, know that I needed some money? I said, the Lord told me to give you some money. She said, I've been out to the church all morning praying that God would bless me. You see, God is saying, I have given us the ministry of serving people. Don't allow a few bucks to rob you of your compassion. Don't allow a few bucks to stop God from blessing you because we have not been obedient to him. God is saying, I will build a special group of people who have been called by my name, who will seek my face, who will honor me with their lives. All they have belong to me, and they're willing to share it with a world that needs Jesus. So would you agree that the ministry is right? Would you agree that the method is right? Would you agree that the mission is right? But what are you to say? What are you to say when you're doing the ministry? Would you agree that the message is right? The message of why we were yet sinners. The message of Jesus died for us while we were yet sinners. He went to an old rugged cross. He took all of our sins and all those who are to come. He took everybody's sin. He died perfect tense, which means he died once, and the results of his dying is eternal. He died for all of us that we can know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship is suffering. Why? Because one day, we, like Paul, would say, we will attain the resurrection from the dead. And God is saying the message is love. The message of what you are doing today and what you are doing this week, you are loving out loud. The Bible tells us this way, for the fruit of the Spirit is love. I believe you need to put a colon there. I don't think you should have a comma there. In Greek, we don't have commas and semicolon. We put that in there. The way I translate it is this. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, colon. How do you describe love? Kindness, long-suffering, gentleness. Those characteristics describe the fruit of love the way I interpret that scripture. For the fruit of the Spirit is love. For God is love, and love is of God. And God is saying to us, love one another as I have loved you. Love white people. Love black people. Love Hispanics. Love ethnic people. Just love people. Love. The message of forgiveness. He forgives us. If we will confess our faith, he will be faithful and just to cleanse us, to forgive us and cleanse us from what? All unrighteousness. Second class conditional sentence, if. What do if mean? It means this. Maybe you do, but maybe you don't. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. If condition. It is dependent upon how you respond 
to what God is doing in our hearts and our lives. The message of love, the message of forgiveness, the message of hope, the message of joy in spite of your pain, the message is right. The message of salvation found in no other name except the name of Jesus. That's our message to a dying world. Do you agree that message is right? I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I have given you the keys to the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth have already been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth have already been loose in heaven. So the mission is right. The method is right. The ministry is right. The message is right. The mission strategy is right. How are we to do this? What did he tell us to do? He, taught, he tells us in Acts 1-8, after the Spirit of God comes up on you, you will begin in Jerusalem. You will start at home. You will begin to share the good news of Jesus Christ in your home. You know, your folks remember what, how you used to be. And sometimes the hardest people to witness to is in your house. You know, I, 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 I'm from Jackson. I've been gone almost 40 some years. When I go back to my home church pastor, I'm still Lil Kenny. I'm still Lil Kenny. I don't care how many years, how many years I've been preaching. I don't care what I, how old I get to them. I'm still what? I'm still Lil Kenny. And God is saying to us, the mission strategy is to start at home. Start being a witness in your home. Start being a witness in, on, your, in, on your job. Be a witness in your Jerusalem. Make names. How many people are you praying for who do not know Jesus? Why don't you make a list of 10 people who don't have a relationship with Jesus? Why don't you start calling their names out to Jesus? Maybe it's an uncle, maybe it's a mama, maybe it's a daddy, maybe it's a daughter, maybe it's a son, maybe it's an auntie, whoever, maybe it's a neighbor. Why don't you put your name down on a list and call them out before God? Amen. Call them out before God. Why don't we do that today? Our Jerusalem and all of Judea and all of Mississippi and all of the, your county, you're going to be a witness. In your Samaria, across North America, across ethnic groups, in your Samaria. Around the world, you're going to send missionaries out. This church is going to be involved in proclaiming Christ around the world. You're going to send Taylor out. You're going to send other missionaries out. And we and me, we got to support them as they go out. Amen. In all the world, after the Spirit of God comes up on you, you will be my witnesses. No, Craig, you got a, you got a witness at around the world. You got a witness in Mississippi. You got a witness among ethnic groups. You got a witness in your Jerusalem. You are doing what Christ has called you to do. And so therefore, the mission strategy is right. My last point, I know my time is up. My last point. Not only the mission strategy is right, would you agree that the minister is right? And I'm not talking about Pastor Dan, amen. You may think he's right, but I'm talking about the Messiah. I'm talking about Jesus is right. One who called us out of darkness and into the marvelous light, and he tells us to go. He tells us to love. He tells us to go, to love. Draw near to me, and I draw near to you, as he tells his disciples in the rest of this text, that he must go to Jerusalem to die. And Peter said, oh, no, no, no. He said, get thee behind me, Satan. 
because he knew his mission. And we know our mission. We know the mission strategy. We know the method. We know the ministry. We know the uh, what mission strategy, uh, the mission of the church. We know the message. And the minister, our Savior, is right. Jesus says it this way, if you love me, if you're going to love out loud, keep my commandments. Let me ask you a question. Now, I'm going to ask you a personal question today. Pray about it before you answer with your hands. If you love the Lord, don't fool me now. If you really love the Lord, raise your hand up high. If you really love the Lord, don't fool me now. If you love him now, which means you know him. All right, hands down. Now, don't raise your hand on this question. Those of you who raise your hands, if you love the Lord, my question is, are you obeying the Lord? Don't, don't raise your hand. Are you obeying him? But that was the same question. That was the exact same question, though. Because the Bible says it this way, if you love me, what? Keep my commandments. If, maybe you do, but maybe by your behavior, maybe by your belief, maybe by your attitudes, maybe you don't. If you love me, obey my commandment. To, uh, my commandment is to love one another. To love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And so that's what God is saying to us today. The mission is right. What's right with the church? The mission is right. The method is right. The ministry is right. The mission strategy is right. And our Savior. He is right. Lord, we love you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for the joy of our salvation. Thank you for your people today, Father, who is loving out loud. And Lord, we pray right now, as we leave this place, help us to realize, Lord, we are leaving here to be on mission with you. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All heads still bowed. All heads about. As our musician began to come and play softly. Maybe you're here today. No one moving. Maybe you're here today. If you know that you need Jesus, you know that you don't have a personal relationship with him, you know that you need to be saved, you know if you were to die today, you would bust hell wide open. While the blood is still running warm in your veins today, but God is speaking intimately in your heart today. Drawing you to him today. Saying, I love you. I got a better life for you. Change need to come. You can't continue this way. If you're here today and you need to pray this prayer, Lord, I'm tired. I'm hurt, I'm confused, I'm lost. Lord Jesus, I believe that Jesus Christ died on a cross for me. I repent of my sin of unbelief. I invite you to be the Lord of my life, to save me to control me, to change me. I give you my life. Amen. It's just your prayer today. In a few moments, Pastor Dan and others will be down front, and we're going to give you an opportunity to allow us to celebrate with you because heaven is already celebrating because God knows your heart. God knows how you responded. 
But we want to respond. We want to celebrate with you as well. In a few moments, we're going to stand and sing a song. We're going to ask you to step out on the first stand to, to, we can celebrate what God is doing in your life. Maybe you're here today and you need a fresh start. You have been disobedient. You know it. You know that you are not worshiping God with all of your heart and your mind and your soul. You know you're just doing things just to get by. You know maybe you just come to church because your parents invite you to bring you to church and you know your heart is far, far away from God even though you have been born again. Maybe you are here today and you need to say, yes, Lord, I need a fresh start today, Lord. Maybe you are here today. Maybe you need to come today. Maybe you're here today and been coming to the North Course. And God is saying, today is a day that you need to be discipled. You need a pastor today. You need a life group today. You need to be involved in ministry today. You need a church today. Today is the day for you to come. Whatever God is saying to you today, you need to come. Maybe you're here today. You need somebody to pray with you today. You are struggling. You're struggling with pain in your life. Pain because of illness. Pain because of rebellious children. Pain because you need a job. Pain because you don't know how you're going to make it. Whatever it is, God understands. He loves you. We loves you. Will you come? This is the time that we allow God to break the ground, the strongholds in our, of the devil in our lives by responding in faith to him. We're not going to try to manipulate you, but as soon as we begin to sing, step out and acknowledge what God is doing in your heart today. Amen.